The Holy Trinity as you've never seen before, the secret reincarnation of Jesus Christ as the Buddha, Satan walking among us. These are just three of the shocking topics in today's video that are going to change your perception of religion. The Mesopotamian Trinity The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit Even if you're not religious, you're likely familiar with the Holy Trinity. But what if I told you that the Holy Trinity is a lie? The original Holy Trio were Anunnaki gods from ancient Mesopotamia. Anu, Enlil, and Enki were the three points that made up the original Holy Trilogy. Anu was the god of the sky, father of the gods, and ruler of the heavens. Enlil was the lord of the wind, king of the gods, and father of the moon. Enki was the son of Enlil, lord of the earth, prince of heaven, and the savior of mankind. In the Mesopotamian version of the Holy Trinity, Anu was God, Enki was Jesus, and Enlil was the Holy Spirit. Anu was one of the earliest gods worshipped by the Sumerians. His name has been discovered in pieces of cuneiform writing from the earliest dynastic period in 2900 BC. He operated as the omnipotent ruler of everything until he passed the job down to his son, Enki. Much like how the New Testament focuses primarily on Jesus, the old Sumerian religious writings focused heavily on Enki, the Holy Son. Keep in mind that there are some big differences between the two characters. Enki wasn't a carbon copy of Jesus. He was more of a godly figure, whereas Jesus was a prophet and the son of God. According to Sumerian legend, Enki was the creator of humanity. He founded the city of Eridu, believed to be the first city in Mesopotamia. The founding of the city resulted in the start of humanity. Eridu has been directly connected to the myth of the Garden of Eden, with each place acting as the starting point for human civilization. What Enki and Jesus had most in common was that they were teachers. Enki came down to earth to create humans and share with them his knowledge of the afterlife. Jesus also shared his knowledge of heaven and eternal salvation. Many aspects of Jesus Christ definitely came from Enki, who was a god thousands of years before the New Testament was ever written. Enlil, the third member of the Holy Trinity, didn't start out as a particularly important deity. But as Sumerian culture evolved, he was promoted to rule alongside Anu and Enki. Enlil was in possession of the Tablets of Dynasty, which gave him incredible power over space, time, and the human race. Enlil was the one who summoned the Flood to kill off humanity. Just like in the Bible, the Flood wiped out everyone except one man and his family. Udnapishtim was warned about the Flood by Enki, who didn't want his precious humans going extinct. The Yuletide Throw the Yule Log on the Fire The word Yule is synonymous with Christmas and, for some reason, logs. But what does it even mean? You'll be surprised to find out that Yule was an ancient winter festival celebrated by pagan tribesmen before the invention of Christianity. Germanic paganism was all the rage in the Dark Ages, even when Christianity was dominating Rome and the New East. The modern definition of Yule is the Feast of the Nativity of Jesus Christ, better known as Christmas. In the Dark Ages, it was a midwinter festival connected to the Norse god Odin. Germanic tribes would get together around the winter solstice to do a lot of feasting and a lot of merrymaking. If you looked into a Germanic home on the night of Christmas Eve 1500 years ago, you'd see a familiar sight. A drunk uncle, a large roasting beast, a decorated tree, and maybe even some gifts. You would also see some things that are less familiar, like a bloody sacrifice for Odin and the other Norse gods. Although I guess that depends on what your Christmas celebrations look like. Maybe you and your family do leave offerings to Odin and his pals. Everyone celebrates the holidays a little differently. In the British Isles, the Celts celebrated their own version of Yule. Their celebrations also involved sacrifice, and something a little more romantic and closer to home. Druid priests would sacrifice a white bull, then they would gather mistletoe as part of the celebration. But what was the cause of celebrating Yule? Did it have anything to do with a baby born of a virgin? Surprisingly enough, it didn't. Up until the 16th century, winter was a brutal time in Europe. During the frigid months, livestock would often perish from famine. So to prevent famine and avoid having to feed the cattle, most cows would be slaughtered. When this happened around December 25th, tribes suddenly had a massive amount of meat. They would stuff their faces at the Feast of Jule, or Yule, which lasted 12 days. 12 is a familiar number, isn't it? Jesus Christ happened to have 12 disciples. There are also 12 signs of the zodiac. A little suspicious, don't you think? The Yule celebration was also about the rebirth of the sun. 
Even though the days were getting colder moving into January, the days were also getting longer. The resurrection of the sun was a big part of Yule, just as the resurrection of Jesus Christ is a big part of Christmas today. The difference is that Yule came first. Jesus the Buddhist, part one. What do you think about Jesus Christ being a Buddhist? If you're not comfortable with the idea, I have some bad news. The Christian Messiah may have been a Buddhist monk trying to spread Buddhism in Jerusalem. Imagine if you picked up a book from the library, started reading, and suddenly some of the pages were missing. This is how it feels to read the New Testament. The Bible talks all about Jesus Christ being born and being a young boy. But then there's a random pause, and it picks up again with Jesus turning 30. Nobody knows what Jesus was doing from the age of 12 to 29. The 18 years are known as the silent years of Jesus. The Bible doesn't have any information about what he did as a teenager or how he lived out his 20s. 18 years is a long time. He must have been doing something. One theory is that he worked as a carpenter in Galilee. But without the Bible giving an explanation, scholars have come up with their own answers. One of the most popular theories, backed up by proof I'm going to give to you in a second here, is that Jesus went on a spiritual journey. He visited India and Nepal. He studied with Hindus and Buddhists. And when he returned to Judea, Jesus' head was filled with new ideas. He wanted to spread those ideas, but his radical teachings got him crucified. I guess people in the first century didn't like new ways of thinking. But just what proof is there that Jesus was trying to teach people Buddhist theory? That's coming up very soon. And now for number 10. But first, I wanted to give a big shout out to Curious and Justin House. Thanks so much for the kind words and for supporting OE. If you're new here, be sure to subscribe and join the family. The Mother Goddess and the Flood Nua is the mother goddess in Chinese mythology. Unlike in most ancient religions, Chinese myth has the creator of humanity being a woman. Her similarities with various pieces of Christianity are going to lead you down a Google rabbit hole of Chinese mythology after this video. Where do I even start with this bizarre goddess? She appears in images as a serpent with the head of a woman. The earliest myths of Nua claim that she created the first human beings from yellow clay. But she got tired, so she dipped some rope into the mud and swung it around above her head. The globs of mud that splattered the earth became the first men and women. Nua was also associated with the myth of virgin birth. Early Chinese legends said that women didn't need men to get pregnant. Childbirth was thought of as a miraculous occurrence, much like how Jesus Christ was conceived through the Immaculate Conception. Nua is already connected to the serpent in the Garden of Eden because of her depiction as a snake. Just like God in the Old Testament, she made men from the soil of the earth. She also saved humanity from a mythical flood. Nua's role in the Chinese flood myth is a little different from God's role in the Old Testament flood. She wasn't the one who caused the flood, but the one who saved humanity from it. The water god Gong Gong broke one of the pillars holding up the sky, causing floods to spread across the world. But Nua saved humanity by tearing a hole in the sky and lifting humans from the water. The Fish this symbol is recognizable immediately by anyone who sees it. What I'm going to tell you about the Jesus fish though, well, let's just hope you're ready for it. The fish symbol you see on magnets slapped to bumper stickers didn't originate with Christianity. The symbol is synonymous with Christ today, but it used to be synonymous with a woman's womb. Look at the so-called Jesus fish for a long second and try to figure out what it really is. Because as you may have guessed, it's not really a fish. The symbol is a pair of overlapping crescent moons. These were initially used as a symbol of a woman's monthly cycle. In early Babylonian mythology, there's a story of a fish that pushed a giant egg out of the river Euphrates. From the egg emerged a mermaid, a mighty goddess of fertility and the ocean named Atagatis. She would later give birth to a son named Ichthys. In ancient times, the Jesus fish was known as the Ichthys symbol. In Greek, the word Ichthys translates directly to fish. It appeared in the Christian world starting in the 2nd century AD. If you're a little confused, it's totally understandable. The main takeaway is that the famous Jesus fish began as a symbol of fertility. It's still a symbol of fertility in the modern pagan world. It's not even supposed to be a fish, it's a womb. Kalki the Destroyer Almost all religions have a harbinger of the apocalypse. In Christianity, it's the Antichrist. In the Hindu religion, which predates Christianity in case you didn't know, it's Kalki, the final incarnation of Vishnu. 
The fable of the Hindu apocalypse shares some enlightening similarities with Christianity's end of days. Before I can tell you about the similarities, I have to wade through some pretty substantial differences. The Hindu belief system says the time is separated into four vast periods, called yugas. The fourth period, Kali Yuga, started 5,000 years ago and is a whopping 432,000 years long. Some simple math tells me we have 427,000 years left before the end of time. I will admit that the time frame doesn't match even a little bit with Christianity, but the details surrounding the Kali Yuga and the Apocalypse are similar. It's said that at the beginning of the Kali Yuga, Lord Krishna disappeared from the earth just like Jesus Christ ascended to heaven. In Krishna's absence, people became obsessed with greed and materialism. Governments became corrupt, human decency eroded, and crime ran rampant. People fought against each other, and wars broke out everywhere. This kind of sounds like what's happening today and what's honestly been happening for the last 2,000 years. Hindu religion says that the world will become so foul that Kalki the Destroyer will arrive to herald the end of times. He'll descend from heaven brandishing a fiery sword and riding upon his white steed. In the book of Revelation, Jesus Christ is one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Jesus is the one who rides from heaven on a white horse to conquer the evils of the world. He and Kalki both ride white horses, and they're both intent on punishing the wicked. I won't say that Jesus Christ is a copy of Kalki, but I think you and I can both agree that their involvement in the apocalypse is strikingly similar. White horses, flaming swords, and defeating evil. Harut, Marut, and the Temptation of Sin I'm going to tell you a story about two angels that will leave you breathless, but I have to warn you that the story doesn't come from Christian mythology. It's not a tale you're going to find in the Bible. It comes from the Quran, with its origin being much, much older. The angels are Harut and Marut. From their stations in heaven, they look down on the humans of earth and ridicule them for their weakness. They laugh and point at the pitiful mortals entrenched in sin. They ridicule men and women for being so weak and unable to resist temptation. God comes to Harut and Marut, telling them that they would act the same if they were mortals upon the earth. Not believing God, the angels make a wager. They say that of course they'll be able to resist temptation because they're not as foolish as mortal men. So God sends the angels to earth, and what do you think happens? They resist temptation for, oh, about 30 full seconds. They're almost immediately seduced by a beautiful woman. During the seduction, somebody witnesses what the angels are doing. Enraged, the angels kill the man. By the end of the night, Harut and Marut succumb to murder, fornication, and excess wine. The angels have no choice but to admit they were wrong. They couldn't resist temptation, and as punishment, they're condemned to hang by their feet at the bottom of a well until the apocalypse. The story is meant to reinforce the idea that the human world is corrupt, and even angels are not immune to its evils. But what I want to tell you about is the origin of the story. Although it first appears in the Quran, it has parallels in more ancient religions. The story of Harut and Marut is just like the Jewish tale of the fallen angels Uzzah and Azael. The strongest connection is the oldest. In the ancient Zoroastrian religion of Persia, created 4,000 years ago, there's a story about two fallen archangels. They're named Haruvatat and Ameritat. Haruvatat sounds dangerously close to Harut, doesn't it? Jesus the Buddhist, Part 2 Was Jesus a Buddhist or not? I promised evidence, and here it is. The first thing you need to know is that Buddhism was already in Judea at the time Jesus Christ held his ministry. Judea was a popular shipping center with merchants from India and the West congregating there. There would have been a lot of different religions in Judea because it was an international port. Don't forget that Alexander the Great invaded India 360 years before Jesus Christ was born. Jesus was born into the Roman Empire. Rome controlled Judea. The Romans sent their gold and goods east trading with India. So, there would have definitely been Buddhists and Zoroastrians in Judea. With that established, let me shock you with the similarities between the Buddha's teachings and Jesus Christ's teachings. Jesus said, do to others as you would have them do to you. That line is from the Gospel of Luke. Consider others as yourself is a Buddhist line from Dhammapada. Love your enemies, do good to those you hate. Bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. Again, Jesus said this in the Gospel of Luke. Compare it to, Overcome anger by love, overcome evil by good. Overcome the miser by giving, 
overcome the liar by truth. Again, this passage is from Dhammapada. There are dozens of other examples I could give you of biblical passages that are almost identical to passages from Buddhist scripture. All the messages are basically the same. Treat others well, love your enemies, turn the other cheek, don't judge needlessly, help the less fortunate, don't kill, shed material wealth, and spread the good word. The similarities, yes, I realize you're likely sick of hearing that word by now, are truly incredible. You could rearrange passages from the Bible with passages from Buddhist scripture and not be able to tell them apart. And what's even more incredible is that Buddhism and Christianity copied earlier messages of love and acceptance from far older sages. King Solomon, who lived in the 10th century BC, predates Buddha and Jesus. Much of what Buddha and Jesus taught came directly from the wise King Solomon. One more weird theory before moving on to the unbelievable human Satan is that Jesus was the reincarnation of the Buddha. Buddha lived about 500 years earlier than Jesus. Buddhist myth says Buddha was going to be reincarnated as another holy man. There are enough similarities between the two figures that, if you subscribe to the theory of reincarnation, Jesus could have been the second coming of Buddha. Human Satan it's time to take a break from our scheduled programming to introduce you to the human Satan. It's a little off topic, but it's bizarre and interesting. So say hello to Michel Diabao Prado, a 49-year-old man from near Sao Paulo in Brazil. He's trying to turn himself into a physical reincarnation of the devil. Michel isn't the type of guy you would want to meet in a dark alley at night, or even in a lighted alley during the day. His teeth are silver and sharp, he's missing a piece of his nose, he has horns and spikes on his head, and he has claws instead of hands. Claws, like real claws. Kind of, but it's complicated. The body modification addict recently had an operation in which his ring fingers were amputated. Instead of having four fingers and a thumb like a normal person, he now has three fingers on each hand to make it look like he has devil claws. Cutting off your own fingers to imitate the devil must be a sin, right? Surely it mentions it somewhere in the Bible. Recently, Guinness gave Michel a world record certificate for becoming the man with the most horn implants on his head. He has 33 implants, which have completely changed his facial structure. In total, though, he's undergone almost 70 procedures. His eyes are demonic. His nose is almost completely cleaved off to make him look ghoulish. He even had silver tusks implanted in his mouth. Oh, and one more nipple of information. Yes, you heard that right, nipple. Michel had his amputated and then ate one of them. Would you ever modify your body in an extreme way? If so, why? Let us know in the comments below, and while you're at it, subscribe. Born of a Virgin Now let's get back to shocking biblical comparisons and take a look at some virgins. Not just any virgins, though. I'll be investigating virgins who gave birth to gods. Jesus Christ wasn't the only ancient figure created through a miraculous conception. So too were other gods from around the world, some you're going to recognize and some that might be new to you. I'll start with everyone's favorite god of war. No, not Kratos, and not Ares either. His name is Huitzilopochtli, the Aztec god of war and the sun. He has all the best features of the Greek gods Ares and Apollo, and he was born without his mother doing the deed. When the Aztec Earth Mother, Quatlique, discovered a mysterious ball of feathers that fell from the heavens, she placed it in her waistband and instantly became pregnant. She already had 400 children, and they were all shocked by how she became pregnant. One of her kids, the moon goddess Coil Xauqui, killed her. Then Huitzilopochtli sprang from his mother's womb, plated in armor. I will admit that the Aztec God of War's birth wasn't quite as peaceful as the birth of Jesus Christ. So let's try a different one. In Chinese myth, a woman named Jiang Yuan was walking alone one day when she accidentally stepped into a giant footprint left behind by the deity Shangdi. The deity was so macho that even his footprint could get women pregnant. Confused about how she became pregnant without being with a man, Jiang Yuan was disturbed and abandoned her baby after he was born. His name was Qi, which translates to mean the abandoned one. His mother did eventually take her son back, though only after she found out he was a god. Qi grew up to be Horji, the Chinese god of agriculture and the legendary primeval ancestor of the Zhao dynasty. There are a lot of other stories like the one of Horus, the patron god of Egyptian kings. His father was Osiris and his mother was Isis. Oh, and by the way, they were brother and sister. 
No offense to ancient Egypt, but you really couldn't find a more incestuous royal lineage unless Game of Thrones came to life. One version of Horus's story is that when Osiris was killed by his brother Seth, his baby-making equipment was thrown into the Nile and eaten by a fish. After Isis resurrected Osiris, they conceived Horus without the proper gear. I'm not sure if that makes Horus the son of a virgin or what. The myth also says that Isis fashioned a new, golden member for her brother Osiris. The whole thing is weird, and now that I think about it, Horus' story doesn't seem that similar to the tale of Jesus. But the overall theme is there throughout the ancient history of women being impregnated by gods through bizarre means. Abraham and the Golden Fleece have you ever noticed the weird obsession with lambs in the Bible? They come up everywhere in the Holy Book and in other religious literature as well. Gods were total gluttons for sacrificial lambs. In the Old Testament, lambs play a key role in the story of Cain and Abel. Abel is a shepherd and Cain is a farmer. Abel sacrifices a lamb as an offering to God, but Cain can only offer fruits and vegetables. God prefers the lamb, making Cain feel like chopped liver, so he kills his brother in a fit of rage. It was the first murder ever, if the Bible is to be believed. What often gets overlooked is that from this point onward, the lamb seems to be the only sacrifice that satisfies God. He asks for them a lot. The story of Abraham and Isaac is a perfect example. After 25 long years of waiting for a son to be born to him, Abraham had his prayers answered. But then God showed up and said, Hey, Abraham, that son you have there that you've been wanting forever. Yeah, I'm going to need you to take him to the top of a mountain and sacrifice him for me. If you could do that by the end of the week, that would be great. It was a pretty big ask, but Abraham was devoted to his God. He took his son Isaac, a couple of servants, and a donkey 50 miles to where God said he needed to go. He took Isaac up the mountain, bound him with rope like an insane serial killer, and then placed him on the stone altar. Just before things got visceral, God stepped in. He gave Abraham a ram to slay instead of his son Isaac. Everybody was happy except poor Isaac who had to grow up knowing that his father was inches away from slaying him. Another example of a sheepy sacrifice comes from the story of the ten plagues. When God set about killing the firstborn children in Egypt, he had the Israelites paint the doors of their homes with the blood of sacrificed lambs. He didn't tell the Egyptians though, so their firstborns were all slain. This god guy is starting to sound like an insane killer. There's another story from Greek mythology that I think fits nicely with the tale of Abraham and his son Isaac. The myth is about Jason and the Golden Fleece. It's more about the Golden Fleece, though. In the legend, there was a wicked woman who commanded that her stepchildren, Phrixus and Heli, be sacrificed as Zeus. But before they could be killed, they were saved by a magical golden ram. The ram picked the children up and flew away with them. One of the kids, Heli, lost his grip on the ram's fur and fell into the ocean. And I'm sad to report that he didn't make it. The other child, Phrixus, flew across the Black Sea until the ram set him down in the court of King Aetes. Then the young boy sacrificed a ram to Zeus in gratitude. The fleece from the ram was sheared by the king and was hung in a sacred grove where it was guarded by a vicious serpent. There are some similarities with the story of Abraham, though it's obviously not identical. It seems like some aspects of Abraham's story may have been lightly plagiarized by the Greeks. The tale of the fleece isn't as old as the Hebrew Bible. Lots of legends and religious myths copied each other, and the Christians aren't the only ones guilty of it. Notice the part about the sacred grove and the serpent, which sounds to me a lot like the Garden of Eden and the serpent. Ancient myths were obsessed with special objects and magical fruits being guarded in paradise-like gardens, almost always by a giant snake. But why is that? Manu and Noah The story of Noah's Ark may have been copied from Hindu mythology. In fact, every flood myth in the world may have originated from Hindu mythology. The tale of Manu and the Great Flood is one of the oldest stories of tidal devastation in the world. But it's not the only one by a long shot. In 1872, archaeologist George Smith changed the world. I don't say this lightly, he really did change the world. George was excavating the ancient Mesopotamian city of Nineveh when he found a clay tablet. After a lot of nights hunched over his desk in the fleeting light of his lantern, he deciphered the text on the tablet. It turned out to be a story that nobody had heard in thousands of years. The story on the tablet was of Noah and his ark, only it wasn't Noah and it wasn't the story from the book of Genesis. The story was nearly identical 
yet it came from the Eridu Genesis, written by the ancient Sumerians. The story was all about how the gods needed to solve the problem of overpopulation. There were too many people around and it was bugging them. They sent a flood to get rid of the pesky humans, allowing one lucky man and his family to survive on a boat. That man wasn't Noah, his name was Atrahasis. In Hindu mythology, the lucky guy was named Manu. His epic narrative appears in the Satapatha Brahmana, an ancient Vedic script. Just like Noah and Atrahasis, Manu is a virtuous man. He was looked upon favorably by the Lord of Heaven, which was why Manu was chosen above all others to survive the flood. Just like Noah, Manu had three sons. Their names were even similar to the names of Noah's sons. Manu's kids were Chama, Shama, and Yapeti. Noah's sons were named Ham, Shem, and Japheth. Not identical, but similar enough to notice. The biggest difference between the Hindu flood myth and other flood myths is that the Hindu version isn't a punishment. The Hindu gods don't destroy the world with a flood as a way to get rid of humanity. Rather, it's seen as part of the natural order of things. The world must be cleansed, though no humans did anything particularly nasty. The rest of the details are the same. Vishnu instructed Manu to build a boat. And what do you think Manu filled his great boat with? I bet you can answer that question all on your own. Manu filled his boat with animals to repopulate the earth. He also filled it with seeds so that he could regrow the plants of the world. After the biblical flood, Noah's Ark came to rest in the mountains of Ararat. After the Hindu flood, Manu's boat rested in the Malaya Mountains. In both stories, the survivors got off their boats and set about the arduous task of repopulating the world. There are other stories I'd love to tell you about, but I'll save those for a future video. There are exciting flood myths in the lore of the Kitsha, the Ojibwa tribe of North America, the Muisca people of Colombia, and much more. Angra Menu and ancient evils. Evil has been a threat to the human race since we started existing. Ancient cultures have found a way to embody the evil they saw in the world by creating their own version of the devil. Satan, as we know him today, is an imitation of countless other primeval villains. Villains like the Zoroastrian devil, Angra Mainyu. Somewhere between 4,000 and 3,500 years ago, the Persian prophet Zoroaster came up with the story of Ahura Mazda and Angra Mainyu. One was the Almighty God, and the other was the antithesis of the Almighty God. Good and evil, holy and unholy, light and dark. In the ancient Avestan language of the Persians, Angra Mainyu means destructive spirit. The deity was seen as the accumulation of all the negative forces in the universe. Yet at the same time, Zoroastrians believed that the universe needed Angra Mainyu. Unlike Christians who believe that only when all the evil of the world is destroyed will the universe be at peace, Zoroastrians understand the value of duality. Theirs was a religion of absolute dualism. The universe was created only when the opposite forces of good and evil worked together. They knew that there couldn't be good without bad. Isn't that what people still say today? You can't truly appreciate how good things are unless you've experienced some difficulties. The one religion that Zoroastrianism really had a profound influence on was Judaism. It's an interesting piece of history that often gets lost in translation. I think you'll find it eye-opening. In the 6th century BC, between 597 and 537 BC, the tribes of Israel were captured and forced into slavery in Babylon. During this time, the tribes of Israel started working on the Hebrew Bible. It was a time in which they were also exposed to Zoroastrian beliefs. Even though Babylon was primarily involved in the worship of the Anunnaki, gods like Marduk, Enlil, Anu, and Enki, Zoroastrianism was widely practiced. It's impossible to say exactly what happened during the development of the Hebrew Bible, but still, so many of its ideas are similar to Zoroastrian ideas that it must have been influenced by the earlier Persian religion. The concept of Angra Mainyu, either directly or indirectly, had a major impact on Judaism's idea of evil. And this, in turn, influenced the development of the Christian idea of the devil. It wasn't just Christianity and Judaism. Zoroastrian beliefs also heavily influenced Mithraism and the religion of Manichaeism. These religions all fed off one another to create their mythologies. Which of these similarities took you by surprise the most? Let us know in the comments down below. And if you enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a like and subscribe to the channel. Thank you so much for watching, and we hope to see you in the next one.
Bye for now. The Chronovisor the chronovisor is a special device supposedly hidden within the Vatican that allows an individual to see through time. The accusations go back to the 1960s when Father Francois Brun met Father Pellegrino Ernetti. Apparently, while the pair were sailing through the Grand Canal of Venice, Ernetti, who worked for the Vatican, revealed the truth of the chronovisor. Ernetti claimed that theories and biblical interpretations were unnecessary because he had seen the truth for himself. He and other priests at the Vatican had used the chronovisor to look into the past and were able to see exactly what happened 2,000 years ago. Unfortunately, we don't have any details about how the machine functions. However, there's an old article from 1972 that was published in La Demonica del Corriere talking about it, and Father Brun wrote of the device in his 2002 book titled Le Nouveau Mystère de Vatican. But still, nobody really knows how it works. Rumor has it that it was built in the 1950s with help from top Italian scientists, and supposedly even the Nazi SS scientist Werner von Braun. There's even been speculation that the Nazis had access to a time machine, although if that were true, they most likely wouldn't have lost the war. The Exorcist and the Devil in 2010, Reverend Gabriel Amoth made a shocking accusation. According to him, the devil resides in the Vatican itself. The Reverend was 85 years old in 2010. For the previous 25 years, he had been the chief exorcist of the Vatican, a position most people likely didn't realize was a thing. In all those years, Gabriel Amoth treated a whopping 70,000 cases of demonic possession, which is a staggering and unbelievable number. He restrained people with ropes, tied them to their beds, and then said prayers to force the demonic entities out of their bodies. This comes as a huge shock, because you would think that with so many exorcisms being done, we would hear something about it in the news. However, these demonic possessions have been almost entirely covered up by the church. Most people have never even heard of the official Association of Exorcists, a club of priests who are responsible for vanquishing demons. According to what Gabriel Amoth said in an interview with the Italian newspaper La Repubblica, the devil is invincible. He explained that the devil can stay hidden, speaks many different languages, and is capable of transforming himself. Sometimes the priest needs six or seven assistants just to hold the possessed individual on the bed while they vomit up nails and shards of glass. As for the devil being in the Vatican, the priest said the evidence was everywhere he looked. Although he didn't mention any names, he did say the devil's work is evident at the Vatican. He believes that cardinals who don't have faith in Jesus Christ, bishops who have covenants with Satan, and all breeds of evil and corruption can be found within the walls of the Vatican itself. Japanese Jesus there is a place in northern Japan that the church really doesn't want you to know about. There's a small village here that claims to be the site where Jesus Christ's tomb is really located. Forget Jerusalem and the Holy Land, Christ's mysterious tomb may be in Japan instead of Israel. According to the legend, Jesus traveled to Japan during his lost years, where he received Buddhist spiritual training. Then after he returned to Israel and was persecuted by the Romans, allegedly his younger brother, Isukiri, took the fall and was crucified instead. Jesus then fled through Russia, across Siberia, and settled in Japan as a rice farmer. He supposedly was married and died at the old age of 106. He also left behind a last will and testament, in which he referred to himself as the fabled Jesus Christ. The Japanese tomb of Jesus is located in Shingo, and it's a major tourist attraction that you won't find in most travel books. His remains are apparently buried underneath a mound on a large piece of property, which is taken care of by his direct descendants. The Sawaguchi family owns the land around the tomb, and they claim to be direct blood relatives of Jesus Christ himself, the power of witches. The church has always tried to silence anyone claiming to be a witch, or at least women who showed any kind of independence, personality, or ambition. But what if the church really did want to destroy witches because they had supernatural powers? Could the church really have hunted down magical women for hundreds of years? In order to try and answer these questions, let's take a look at a woman named Mother Shipton, born Ursula Southall in 1488, England. According to the legends, Ursula was born on a dark and stormy night to her 15-year-old mother, Agatha. 
The woman refused to give any details about who the father of her baby was and eventually became ostracized. She and her young daughter were forced into the woods as pariahs, with the townsfolk claiming the child was conceived by the devil and that Agatha was a witch. The woman was forced to raise her daughter in a cave hidden deep in the woods. They lived a bleak existence together until Ursula was adopted by a family in town. She was taken away and never saw her mother again. At the age of 24, Ursula was married to a man named Tobias Shipton. It was around this time when people began to whisper of the strange powers Ursula supposedly possessed. She was able to heal people with herbal remedies and she allegedly could bewitch people. After her husband died two years into their marriage, she moved back into the cave where she'd been raised by her mom and turned into a full-blown witch. She wound up becoming a sorceress and was able to see into the future. She predicted the Great Fire of London, the creation of the Spanish Armada, and that the world would end in 1881, which obviously didn't happen. Either way, Mother Shipton seems to be proof of some extraordinary power, one that the church tried very hard to eradicate. Jesus the Freemason In 1717, modern Freemasonry got its start in England. Most historians agree that the Masons were descendants of medieval builders' guilds. These people were groups of construction workers who who helped to build the greatest architectural wonders in Europe, such as cathedrals, castles, and other similar buildings. The Freemasons, or at least the modern Freemasons, are mostly the descendants of builders' unions from the Middle Ages. However, if we look further back in time, we can see that Freemasonry has roots originating in the time of the Old Testament. The Freemasons had likely been behind the construction of King Solomon's temple, and some even believe they go all the way back to ancient Egypt. The Freemasons may even be connected to the builders of the pyramids themselves. Supposedly, they have also been the recipients of esoteric knowledge from an unknown intelligence. There are rumors that have circulated claiming that Jesus was a Freemason himself. In one of the forbidden books of the Bible, called the First Gospel of the Infancy of Christ, we hear about Jesus as a young boy. Allegedly, he was such a bright student that his teacher said he had nothing more to learn from them. They were astounded by the young Jesus' knowledge in astronomy, natural philosophy, and even metaphysics, all subjects that are extremely important to the Freemasons. There are even people out there who believe Jesus was the first Freemason, and that his disciples were more like his apprentices than anything else. It's shout-out time! We want to give a big thank you to Huey Hampton and Rude Valve for watching and subscribing to this channel. If you're new to Origins Explained, be sure to subscribe and join the family. Aliens and the Vatican The Vatican supposedly knows that an alien civilization exists. In an extremely strange email sent by the famous astronaut Edgar Mitchell to US politician John Podesta, he allegedly claimed a space war is coming and that the Vatican is well aware of an extraterrestrial civilization. Edgar was once a NASA astronaut, and he's one of the loudest voices in the alien conspiracy theorist community. According to him, the aliens are benevolent and only want to share their technology with humanity. The email also mentions that the Vatican holds extraterrestrial knowledge. At first, it might seem completely crazy, but in reality, the Vatican has been in the space game since they built the Vatican Observatory in 1582. Apparently, they currently have an estimated 10 astrophysicists working for them on undisclosed projects. Clearly, the Church has some stake in the universe, or at least some interest in outer space. Whether they really know about a civilization of aliens or not is hard to prove, but Edgar Mitchell really seems to think so. The Avesta the Avesta is one of the oldest scriptures in the world, and some might consider it to be the original Bible long before the modern-day Bible was ever written. The Avesta is the official holy book of Zoroastrianism, founded by the great prophet Zoroaster between roughly 1500 and 1000 BC. It's an amazing piece of ancient history, a prayer book written in an extinct language called Avestan. According to legends, the original work of 21 books called Nasts was revealed by the one true God to the prophet prophet Zoroaster. The man then repeated the books aloud to King Vishtaspa, who had them inscribed on sheets of gold. In the centuries that followed, the laws of the religion, the customs, and beliefs were all passed on verbally. It wasn't for several generations that the memorized scripture was transferred into the Avesta. But what about this book irritates the church so much? It's due to the fact that the Zoroastrianism religion is considered to be the oldest surviving monotheistic religion in the world. Zoroastrianism is also the 
the original source of concepts found in the Bible, ranging from the devil to the end of days. In other words, this ancient religion and the stories outlined in the Avesta are nearly identical to those found in Christianity and Islam. Since Zoroastrianism was around first, most scholars believe the Christians ripped off most of their ideas. The key to the Holy Sepulchre we talked a little bit earlier about the Church of the Holy Sepulchre and how there are six denominations of Christianity sharing the structure. However, there's one thing the Church really doesn't want the general public to know about. This well-kept secret is that the key to their sacred church, one of the holiest keys in the world, is taken care of by a Muslim family. According to CNN, Adib Jawad Judah al Husseini is the current gatekeeper of the holiest church in Christianity. He belongs to a Muslim family and has been entrusted with taking care of the Christian site for centuries. The cast iron key kept on him at all times is allegedly 500 years old. The reason the key to such an important Christian site is looked after by a Muslim family has to do with neutrality. The Christians, and indeed the church itself, is so unpredictable and untrustworthy that the key to the Holy Sepulchre was given over to a family of totally different faith so that they could remain a neutral guardian. The key itself is a foot long, 0.3 meters, and is a massive piece of cast iron with a triangular metal hand handle and a fat square end. It unlocks the doors to the very place where Jesus Christ was allegedly crucified and entombed. Adib's family has been looking after the key since at least 1517 and it's been passed on from one son to the next. The Immovable Ladder at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, there is a very strange artifact that most people don't even know exists. It's called the Immovable Ladder, and it's one of the true shining examples of the division in the religions of the Holy Land. The Church of the Holy Sepulchre is considered to be one of the holiest places in all of Christianity. It's located in the heart of Jerusalem, and Christians have been making pilgrimages here since the 4th century AD. It was here on this very site where Jesus Christ was supposedly killed and resurrected. Through Throughout the years, different religions have risen, some have split into factions, and nobody has ever been able to agree on how to properly worship God. Because of this, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is currently presided over by six denominations. The Armenian Apostolic, Greek Orthodox, the Roman Catholic Church, the Coptic, the Ethiopian, and the Syriac Orthodox as well. All the different groups occupying the same building have come to create problems over the years. And this brings us to the immovable ladder. In the first part of the 18th century, somebody placed a wooden ladder against the wall of the church. It was most likely placed there in 1728, but nobody knows who's responsible. The ladder hasn't been moved because they weren't sure which organization had placed it against the building. And so, for nearly 300 years now, it has sat in the exact same position, proving just how ridiculously stubborn and bureaucratic the church is. Fake Vatican Treasure Apparently, the Vatican was robbed and they didn't tell the public about it. It was only recently that the US Department of Homeland Security returned a letter written by Christopher Columbus back to the Vatican. It was written in the 15th century by Columbus and was sent to his royal patrons in Europe describing the riches of the New World. The document is worth about $1.2 million and it had somehow been replaced with a forgery. However, the letter was not the original. After Columbus's first voyage to the Americas, he wrote a letter in Spanish in 1493. It was then promptly translated to other European languages and 80 copies were spread across the globe. The document owned by the Vatican was just one of these copies. We don't know how the letter was stolen, only that Homeland Security received a tip in 2011 about a Vatican heist. The church has been understandably discreet about whatever happened. All we know for sure is that the document was purchased for $875,000 by a US collector named Robert Parsons, who didn't realize it had been stolen. Which of these forbidden secrets do you find the most shocking? Let us know in the comments and don't forget to subscribe. Thanks a lot for watching and we'll see you next time. Bye.